and I'm not sure why computers act up, but this week is one example where mine is. I'll keep it short, and thanks for being here. Welcome. And I wanted to show you all the pictures I saved. I want to do this every week, and then I just dump them into a folder and forget about them. But here I was doing some research for something else, as is usually the case, and I ran across the ruins of the Bannerman Castle. Just mind-blowing. And really, I didn't care where it was. I wanted to know more, but again, it was just on my path of research on another topic. So I just took a quick screenshot, as we can see here, and thought we'd come back and have a little look. Just amazing to imagine what kind of people, who, found it necessary to build this on a little island, and we'll get into that, in North America. But before we look at any of that, I want to share this article I found on Gary Shunung. You may remember a recent video where we spent a half hour examining all these sites that he had charted out on the Google Earth. And I posed the question, who is this man? What are his thoughts? As his videos were all silent. And someone shared this in the comments. That's what I love about the comments. You leave any questions I have are quickly answered within the first 24 hours of releasing the video. And we'll just look at some of his pictures and sights as we read what he had to say. From the brink of extinction, ruins of old earth. The reason that we can't understand how ancient people with no technology, machinery, or even decent tools could have accomplished what they seem to have been able to do is very simple. They didn't do it. They occupied and used what was available to them from before a near extinction event occurred. Some of what they were able to use had become exposed by time and erosion. I think that long before that time, the world population had grown way beyond what we currently think is possible for our realm to support. Forgive me, I changed that part. With the methods in use today, there is simply not enough room for all the housing, industry, and agriculture required to support a population of that size. The most important consideration to be able to support an extremely large population would be the ability to provide enough food. There is no way to work around the fact that agriculture requires sunlight and a reliable source of water. There needed to be a way to have enough room for all the people and a way to ensure a reliable source for all the food that was needed. Pyramids are the key to understanding how that problem was solved. In places where erosion had exposed them, the visible evidence varies depending on how much has been exposed and eroded. In spite of that fact, if you spent a little time comparing them, they leave behind very identifiable footprints as they erode away. Evidence in this video suggests that a pyramid was an architectural support the steps of a pyramid supported levels for habitation and industry below the surface. Other functions that appear to have been incorporated into their design include control of networked irrigation and drainage systems and access to other levels. And I have the goosebumps just imagining this superstructure he's talking about. The methods in use at the time would solve many of the problems that we face today, as well as other problems that we have not yet had to deal with. Terrible storms, flooding, droughts, fires, inadequate food production, expensive climate control, and high insurance costs from damages, to name a few. If a surplus of water occurred, it would flow into the network of irrigation and drainage systems be stored in, above, and below ground reservoirs. And here now, tying into the valves and drains that we often discuss. 
The worst damage that would occur would be localized crop damage from some type of storm. There appear to have been both dome-shaped and long rows of surface structures that are eroding away, with interior divisions being exposed by wind and water erosion. There are places with erosion occurring by levels that are loaded with this type of footprint that pyramids leave behind, as well as fractures in the surface of the higher ground in the surrounding areas that lead to evidence of being artificially supported. Some of the most interesting places to examine are where it seems that one layer is eroding away and exposing another, especially if the surface that is eroding away has features that do not appear to have been naturally formed. Random thoughts, he says. The longest north and south line at the bottom of the Pacific is 8 to 10 miles wide, so there are intersecting ones, and can be followed for 2100 miles in a perfect line. The symmetry of some of the underwater mounds is amazing. Pick out a perfect looking 20 mile in diameter mound. If you anchor Google's measuring tool in the right place, you can go the same distance in any direction and be at almost exactly the same depth. The similarity of circular formations in different sizes on land is obvious, including the location of possible supports around the outside diameter in predictable locations. Evidence at Easter Island and at Train Rock, which follows Easter Island in the video, appears to support that possibility. What is left at Stonehenge could be the center support structure of an ancient dome-shaped building. There is another location that looks very similar to Stonehenge, but has not been exposed. The material used for construction was not quarried, finished to size, and set in place. It was poured. Today the binding agents are separating from the sedimentary material and being carried to lower levels by the flow of water. There are similarities between the large statues at Easter Island and columns found in ancient ruins that could mean that the natives of Easter Island carved existing ruins there to make the statues. It is very likely that Angkor Wat was created out of what was left of an eroding pyramid. There are pyramids in Australia. The evidence of ancient east-west irrigation channels around the Oka Van Gogh Delta in South Africa covers approximately 500 by 700 miles. What can be seen at Gobekli Tepe appears to support the possibility of habitation below the agriculture. Machu Picchu is just a small example of that type of evidence. We've wondered why we can't find evidence of what hit the ground in Crater National Park but never wonder how it could blast a square hole in the ground. I suspect our near extinction event may have been similar to what happened at Tunguska in 1908, but on a much larger scale, large enough to fracture the Earth's crust, push part of it down into the core. And here again, his four excellent videos posted on Vimeo, and very refreshing to hear his thoughts after seeing his work. I think on many of these points, I can agree. And now back to this Bannerman castle. But first, let's have a look at this melted building. What would I need to do to prove to you that this was once a glorious building, now in ruins? And when I say melted buildings, it's very generic. It could have been hit by some plasma or frequency, displacing every fiber of it. And you can see what the primitive people have done. They've just come out and chipped away at these little veils of rock covering all the openings after this event. And once they figured this out, they just start chipping away at all of them, but many still remain. And I think if we could get deep enough into this structure, we would see even more preservation. But back to the Bannerman Castle. And sometimes I research because I think I should, at least some particular subject. But this is just something that absolutely fascinates me. I don't care if I had never done any research into this subject. If I came across some pictures like this, I would want to know everything about it. 
And, as usual, we'll start with what they have to say. We'll start with this island that it sits on. It's a 6.5 acre island in the Hudson River in New York. The principal feature on the island is the Bannerman's Castle, an abandoned military surplus warehouse. Oh shit, I wasn't expecting something so ridiculous right off the get-go, right in the first sentence. Again, let's have some idea of what this military surplus warehouse could look like. Can you imagine the conversation in the day? If it were true. Lieutenant, take a few men and build us a military supply warehouse on that little island over there. No problem, boss. And then the boss shows up. Lieutenant, what have you built? Where did you get these millions of bricks and all the concrete? And of course, this narrative they're trying to sell us is very similar to a comedy. It certainly has become comedy to me. And they tell us the island's about 50 miles north of New York City, and about a thousand feet from the Hudson River's eastern bank. It covers about 6.5 acres, most of it rock. This must have been no problem for the eager lieutenant. Early history. Polapel Island was discovered by the Europeans during the first navigation by early Dutch settlers. During the Revolutionary War, Patriots attempted to prevent the British from passing upriver by placing upright logs tipped with iron points between the island and Plum Point. Caissons from several of these defenses still rest at the river bottom. Still, these obstructions did not stop a British fleet from burning Kingston in 1776. General George Washington just to give you an idea of how old these ruins are, according to the narrative, later signed a plan to use the island as a military prison. However, there is no evidence that a prison was ever built there. We're told George Washington signed a plan to make the island a military prison. What a stupid waste of George's time back then with land everywhere like you need to sign a damn plan to build a prison on an island and let me just show you this island here we go this island sitting in the river and permission was needed if anything it was a stupid plan you could have built all this over here and not have to trek your materials across the river and george washington should have been impeached for even signing such a stupid plan if any of this was true, George and his wooden teeth. And so this just kind of comes out of the blue. They started off by telling us that it was a military storage facility. Now telling us they wanted to build a prison out here, but it fell through. And yet look at this. This looks like some sort of video game fantasy land. How realistic they are nowadays, but not quite. Just like this some land of zelda you can see how old school i am i haven't played video games in quite a while and clearly a lot did happen out here and here we go have you ever heard of this island or castle look at this bridges to nowhere in the middle of the river and it's not like this is just a lake and right off the get-go this story doesn't hold up just this little section right here. Why? Stupid enough to build on this island in 1777. Oh, but just why not build out in the middle of the water? Oh, well, that's gonna be easy in this time period. So, we haven't even begun. We're told this is an abandoned military surplus warehouse. George Washington signed a bill that would use the island as a military prison. Again, if you remember me showing the prison in Salt Lake City in 1850, it was a castle, just a beautiful castle. And I've said in many of my videos, military posts and munitions, depots, always get the castles. Of course, if you were inheriting and designating every leftover building 
We would certainly not leave these to the peasants. They would be forced to build little shanties and log huts. And what about this bannerman? We have this name bannerman all over this island and castle. Francis Bannerman was born in 1851. Of course, right when things really start rolling in our narrative. Anything before this date and taking the history seriously is a waste of time. We can only gather clues before this date. This is the actual date of when it seems our narrative is beginning. Yet if we're reading it on the internet as here we are, it's still going to be packed full of lies. He emigrated to the United States with his parents in 1854. His grandfather was from Scotland. The family moved to Brooklyn. These people, I mean, in this time period, you're not going far. You know, it's not like you're jumping on a plane and just flying around and... Even if you were able to do such things, where's all the money coming from? But no, these people just leave Ireland, move to Brooklyn, and began a military surplus business. Come on! You just get into the military surplus business in 1854, fresh off the boat from Ireland? Yes, that is what they tell us. At the end of the Civil War, he began buying up military equipment. 1897, they opened up a business on Broadway. The business bought weapons directly from the Spanish government before it evacuated Cuba. You just can't make deals like this in this time period. There's no phone, there's no internet. Making a deal with another country to purchase their old military equipment? Yes, that is what they tell us. And in 1900, Mr. Bannerman bought an island. This island. And if Monopoly wasn't such a small board game, the next step would have been to purchase an island. They tell us because his storeroom in New York City was not large enough to provide a safe location for his 30 million surplus munitions cartridges, he began building an arsenal on this island. He designed buildings himself and let the constructors interpret the designs on their own. Just winging it, basically, they're telling us, and turning out this amazing castle. Perhaps this was their interpretation. And construction finally ceased with Bannerman's death in 1918. Of course, a death or a fire. But there's more. In 1920, 200 pounds of shells and powder exploded, destroying a portion of the complex. Oh, that's more like it. I thought they were going to deviate from their typical narrative. And after the sinking of a ferry boat, which had served the island in a storm in 1950, the arsenal and island were essentially left vacant. That's it. Just like they only had one boat to get to and fro. And the whole thing was abandoned until 1967. Ah, uh, yes, the year where people seemed to pull their heads out of their asses. The old military merchandise was removed and tours of the island were given. However, a year later, fire devastated the roofs and floors. And once again, the island was placed off limits to the public. And the castle is currently the property of New York Parks and Recreations and is mostly in ruins, since the internal floors and non-structural walls have since burned down. The island is the victim of vandalism and trespassing, neglect, and decay. And here we can see a picture of the collapsed wall viewed from the shore. What a crappy, grainy picture. But just to give you an idea, bordering something we would see in India. Just mind-blowing. A castle plus. And what a stupid story. And going back to my last video on Pompeii, I would say that a structure like this is easily a thousand years old. Just sitting in this condition the whole time. The whole story is complete BS. And what else could I say about this glorious castle? 
Surely it's absolutely strange, even to the layman. Hence why there are so many beautiful photographs of it, invoking an absolute sense of mystery and wonderment. And as excited as I am, I'm equally terrified that somebody has plans to take a wrecking ball to this. Simply the most beautiful castle I've seen today, or at least in the last couple weeks. How many millions of bricks in this absolutely early time period? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven stories for this armory. Certainly, if I was tasked to build an armory, it would only be one story. Very dangerous before the elevator to be hauling explosives up and down flights of stairs. And sometimes I think I've seen it all, or heard it all. And then one photograph comes along, like the one that led me to this quest today. And here you go. Here are the remains of the old world, not of a ammunition warehouse. How stupid and insulting. And then things like this? What if things like this? Where did this fit into their narrative? Again, made of brick and facade and ornamentation, like a craft that has all but been lost in our time. Very difficult to find someone to build anything these days. Definitely a shortage of construction labor, certainly farmers. I think only 1% of the population grows our food. Just crazy, one of the most important things. It makes me think about what kind of food the builders of this architecture ate. I'm sure it was really tasty, judging by their aesthetic, architectural appreciation and abilities. These are not a hot dog and hamburger eating people. And while on the subject of nourishment, could one eat light? And we are even told that we derive vitamin D from sunlight. And what other nutrients could we derive from light, air, water, and ether? And I'm sure these builders could tell us. And as is the case with every single one of my videos, I could go back in to any particular topic and spend days researching and this is one great example i don't want to leave this topic i don't want to forget this makes me very emotional so i think that's it for this week i thank you for joining me be sure to check out my coffee on amazon i love you all and i'll see you next week